Young to Capitalism, sponsored by Transform Europe. <laughs> Thank you for all of the support. Uh, yesterday we listened to a lot of great, uh, no, yesterday to a great discussion, and today to a lot of um, to a lot of workshops and uh, yeah, on the expropriation of Facebook, on Twitter, and um, yeah, we we know that commercial platforms and private media dominate our news next to the public outlets we also discussed. <laughs> But, fortunately, there are alternatives, <laughs> and we have some of them here. We will now take a closer look at them, and uh, all of our guests will share their hands-on perspectives on the daily joys and struggles of providing independent coverage all over Europe. Um, I will lead you through the discussion, and at the end, if we have time left, you are also more than welcome to ask what you always wanted to know. My name is Seda Jan Aslan, I'm a member of the Kripovi Orga team, our network <laughs> for critical communication studies. And uh, one technical note, the panel will be filmed, so, yeah, it's just so you know. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to thank my colleagues, Laura Porak and Kerem Schamberg, maybe you can stand up for a second, because you invited all of these uh, left media departments. <laughs> spectacular guests for today's panel. We will start with the oldest medium in this circle, Landa, that would be yours. Uh, Landa Arbeit uh, works for the Basque medium Agia. Welcome. <laughs> That's your time. <laughs> Thank you. Landa also brought along a lot of uh, different versions uh, of the magazine and uh, Kevin will now spread them out so you're <laughs> welcome to, uh, to take them home with you if you understand us. <laughs> <laughs> if not, you can look at the pictures. <laughs> or are you going to translate later? Maybe if you ask. <laughs> okay, um, then most of the German-speaking people here will probably know our uh, next guest, Ines Schwertner. Chief Editor of the German version of the Jacobin magazine. Welcome. <laughs> then, all the way from Poland, let us welcome Bojan Stanislavski, the Senior Editor of Barikada, a media outlet with leftist views from uh, Eastern Europe. <laughs> And now, Vienna's finest, or as I may say after our pre-talk, Vienna's funniest. No, Uli not in English. I'm sorry. <laughs> we will see. Uli Weich, the director of Radio Orange, and not Radio Orange, the free radio station here from Vienna. and uh, Konstantinos Poulis from the Press Project in Greece. He couldn't come today, but we will be glad to welcome him another time. So, all of our guests have a lot to tell, uh, but we only have, as usual, limited time. So, I will probably interrupt at some points to keep the thread of our panel, but um, you're welcome to ask the guests a lot of questions also after this panel. So don't be shy, and yeah, just inject. Um, first of all, I kind of clustered the discussion um, with different points, and first of all, I want to know more about the different ways you organize yourself. We always discuss the different or alternative ways of uh, organization. And I want to start with Bojan. Um, Barricade is a limited liability company in Germany, it's GmbH, Gesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung. You're one of the three partners. Why did you choose this very classic economic model for your media outlet? Because it was the easiest to register. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's very difficult probably for some of the people here uh, who have not had dealt with the state bureaucracy, particularly with state bureaucracy in Eastern Europe, what what amount of hardships you have to go through if you want to register something unusual. I mean, it could be a corporation, a cooperative story, or uh, some kind of, you know, NGO. Uh, like, you, you, you need, there's like, 
one requirement after another which we were just not able to meet either quantitatively or qualitatively for all kinds of reasons so uh, <clears throat> and, and that's so that's one re one element here and the other element is that uh, this sort of entity a classical company is least suspicious I mean, I don't know how things uh, look in Germany or Austria or in Western Europe from that point of view, I've never investigated it, but in Eastern Europe, NGOs are normally related with sleazy things. I mean, that's how, how people associate it. I'm not saying that all NGOs are bad or anything like that. I'm not evaluating them or judging them by any stretch here. But w what I want to say is that, you know, when you say you represent a foundation, then, you know, it's always kind of suspicious and when you have a company it's also um, very transparent in terms of financing I mean it's obvious like when you run a company you you you, you have uh, business partners you invoice them you collect the um, revenue you pay your taxes according to a code that is widely known so uh, we thought that this is the way for us to go. And the third element, last but not least, but I have to mention that I know we have very little of the time, but this is very important really here because, you know, this is also the way for us to finance truly independent crew, editorial crew, because we run a company, we run a business, and on the basis of the income that the company generates, we're able to finance and support the initiatives that are our political mission. So, had it not been for the company, had it not been for the commercial activity, we wouldn't have had Buddy Cutter. Thanks. Thank you uh, for the insight, Ines. Jacobin also has the same model of a GmbH, a limited liability company, but you decided to become part of what we call the German Gemeinwohlökonomie, and the English term is economy for the common good. What does that mean for the magazine? Uh, well, yeah, not that much, <laughs> but uh, it sounds really good. <laughs> but um, no, I, I wanted to add to Boyan because it's actually because it's the same model, and I just wanted to stress like all the points that you uh, made are also completely true for us. Like uh, I think usually also left wing projects in Germany, everyone asks us, "Are you from the party? Are you funded by I don't know the foundation? You know, there was a Luxembourg Foundation, and we always say no, we're politically independent, and this is worth." It has its own worth, and so it's like something, yeah, I think that you just choose to be financially independent from all institutions um, makes you, yeah, I think if you also want to pursue a journalistic project and your own political project, I think it's really important to do that, and this is, as you said, the easiest way. Um, but to come back to your question, uh, a colleague of ours, we have like five people in this kind of uh, GmbH, and one of them is really was really strong about this Gemeinwohl Ökonomie. And it basically means that you're part of this program with 200 companies uh, in the German-speaking world, um, I don't know, next to it's cool or something, where you um, basically ensure and have, get a certificate that you have like uh, workers' rights, that you produce ecologically um, like fair products, where does our paper come from, we print in Berlin, all that. And I mean, it's, I think it's nice to have, and it's also good to have this certificate, because you, it's, a, it's, it's a sign. But I mean, we're also a socialist magazine, so we want more than just to have a certificate that we're green and, and fair, and you know, fair to our workers. I mean, that's, as I said, it's fine, and yeah, I, it's on our website, and it's okay um, to have this kind of ideological kind of, uh, I don't know, signature, but I think to us, I mean, we would expropriate not just the Tribune, but everything if we could. So, I mean, <laughs> I think we are actually in our politics, we're, I think, more radical. We go way, I don't know, way far than uh, probably the other companies uh, that have the certificate. So, I'm always a bit like, it's not my passion to be part of the environmental economy, but it's also, I think, it's a good thing. And it's also, it's, it's a sign towards, I don't know, better kind of economy, but... It's not socialism. Okay, thank you. And maybe you can yeah, also show the magazine. Yeah. Um, because it's very stylish, you know. Yeah. Genuine. I always say it's beautiful, very but pretty. if you show it, then it's different. <laughs> and um, now I want to ask Uli, because Radio Orange is a non profit association, in German, Gemeinnütziger uh, Verein, with a paid staff of 15 people. 
12. 12. Oh, 12, sorry. And you said that you have the most diverse staff. How come and why is that important for a free radio station? You said it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I said you have diverse staff. <laughs> first of this all, we have about uh, 500 uh, radio makers who uh, make the content in uh, free engagement. Um, this is the bitter pill and we have 12 uh, people who are uh, also not uh, full uh, paid. There is a um, part-time employment. Um, we have 10 hours uh, per week till 30 hours. So you see it's not a big uh, structure behind this. Um, our diversity team is 70% are women and also non-binary person. Um, four uh, um, people are not heterosexual. Um, there is a big uh, age um, range. range between 25 and nearly 60. Um, half of the people have children, parents half not. Um, five uh, people of 12, and you hear I have a boring um, uh, school English. I'm not uh, um, in a, yeah, I haven't talked in English since two and a half years, so you uh, really stressed to hear me. Um, yeah, and five a person, uh, about 12, are um, uh, also multilingual, so they have not German as the first language. Um, two of ten people are not white, and four are of Eastern Europe. So Vienna is a town which is uh, famous about the car and car history, so we have it also in our staff. Um, Königlich, Kaiserlich, and the Imperium, and so on. And we are the biggest uh, German town after Berlin. So you see a lot of communities, a lot of heterogenic, a lot of fighting power, a lot of uh, conflicts in refugee uh, contexts, and so on. And a lot of post-colonial debates, of course, or post-imperial, or imperial. Neo Imperial debates. Thank you very much for the first insights. I think uh, of what I thought was very, very interesting is said that you, on a regular basis, you do evaluations of the structure um, or of the culture, um, of the editing culture in the different programs that you have in the channel. Maybe you can share some more info. Yes, we are a community uh, radio, CV radio. So you uh, know it, it's a free speech when you have an idea to make a program. So you send your audio file, you send a small concept. Uh, because we have a lot of programs, we have about uh, 220 different programs on air uh, in 25 languages and we have it also in the uh, archive, not uh, every program but a lot of them. I can also talk about this, it's not only fluid, it's also in the internet uh, and in the archive. And, uh, when you have a free channel, so it's changing all the time and it's necessary to have a look after two years, three years, who is here, who went, who was gone, who uh, uh, is not here anymore and why. And uh, we had a very uh, interested uh, program about ref refugee radios and after two years we see <coughs> Uh, a lot of the people are especially uh, vulnerable, vul vulnerable, and uh, Ehrenamt is precarious, so we have to think about uh, projects, so we are, a, that's a horrible working thing, Boris said it in a perfect English, uh, to have this horrible <laughs> bureaucracy, so we 
are addicted on this and uh, we don't love it but uh, we have it and we are completely um, addicted on the media founding, on the state media founding, on the tax Let's politic talk about and this money is <laughs> also not, we are not beyond capitalism, that's a great title, maybe we come in this direction with you, but we are in between. Okay, let's talk about the money topic uh, afterwards, but now, um, or in the next section, uh, Landa, your magazine is uh, cooperative by now, um, can you explain to us, because it has been mentioned in the last, uh, in the last hours a lot, is that a possible alternative, how does your cooperative work? How many people are there? How, who works for what? Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And yes, uh, Argia is a cooperative. We are 25 workers. And out of 25, 22, we are members of the cooperative. But um, I will do a horrible thing. I will explain uh, our history in one minute. Uh, Argia, Argia is 103 years old project. Uh, it was created in 1919 in Pamplona. It was a religious uh, magazine. Uh, and at first it was like this. In, in the 36, 1936, uh, the Spanish Civil War uh, broke up and it was stopped and banned. And uh, the ones doing that had to fly. Later, we suffered a 40 years old fascist dictatorship, and in between, they began publishing it uh, little by little because it was religious. Later, the Basque Country was like a bomb, uh, socially and politically talking, and the religious magazine became little and little by little more journalistic, more rebel, more uh, socially answering uh, the Franco regime, and. Uh, people who were thinkers and stuff began writing that magazine. So in the 80s, uh, you can see like front pages like the hand and uh, the religious magazine. So the owners were not quite happy with that. So they decided to close it down or sell it to someone. And in that moment, uh, Franco died. It was like a changing moment. Uh, and two workers decided to mortgage their houses and buy the, the magazine to the, to the church. So in that moment, uh, Argia means light. Before the name was light of heaven, they changed the name and it became only light. Uh, <laughs> and since the 80s, uh, we are cooperative and the workers, we are the owners of the magazine. So we organize ourselves, uh, we do what we, don't, uh, what we want. Uh, I don't know. We it, we think you ask me why uh, why why do you why did you decide to organize like a cooperative? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a way that all the workers can learn a lot about the company because it's yours and you have to be responsible of the of the project. It's, you are not just a worker; you are the owner, and you learn how to grow with it and you defend it, and it's yours. And it's also a militant thing, because it's in Basque language, and for us it's like a lesser used language, and it's something very important, and we fight for it, and, and yes, I don't know what to say. Uh, we organized in a, before it was, like, since we have 100 years old uh, history, there, there has been a lot of changes also in the project, and in the last decade, uh, especially after the crisis in 2008, we made a lot of changes inside, uh, and for example, but we decided to change our organization. Instead of having a hierarchical organization, we made a horizontal uh, organization. We all have the same salary. Uh, I don't know, we, we decided to take out the editor-in-chief or the director of the magazine. Now we don't have any director and we organize ourselves. Or Maybe you say something about the working groups that you have? Yes, yes, we, we have like, uh, our uh, magazine is organized like the journalist uh, group, the staff, the ones making commercial work, 
and the administration. But apart from that, we have like work groups like uh, subscriptions or uh, the um, online shop or other publications or things we have to do to earn more money to sustain the project. So in these work groups, there are people from all the three uh, journalists, uh, uh, commercials and administrations. And we meet like once a week or uh, once every two weeks. So in all, between all of us, we try to do all we have to do apart from. So I am a journalist, for example, myself. I work, I, I write about politics or I make the front page of the magazine. But apart from that, I am in the subscription uh, uh, work group. So we think about campaigns and stuff, or some other people are uh, extra publications, or like this, or we somehow organize it that way. Okay, thank you. Subscriptions will be the next uh, question, um, because now we're going to the topic money. So let's talk about the money. Landa and Ines, your magazines, um, most of the money from your magazines comes from subscriptions, actually. And uh, for the last years, the print market seemed to be dead. And I was wondering, how did you manage, as your magazine, um, to get so many subscribers who are willing and who are also able to pay uh, for independent journalism every month? How did you do that, Ines? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so first of all, I wanted to uh, tell an anecdote because Sabina started that. <laughs> I thought it would be, uh, would be good to also explain how precarious it actually is because I think we talked about alternatives in a really ideal way. Like, hey, how can we do that? It's so beautiful. It's not. <laughs> uh, it's really like hard work and if you want to, like we uh, did it, we founded like a new publishing house and it's like no one does it anymore. Like no one found like a left-wing publishing house like why would you do that every like all the other publishers are dying and so the lawyer when we went to her at East Berlin and we were like yeah we wanted to found like this uh, socialist publishing house and she was like literally laughing at us and she was like okay I haven't heard this in 30 years this really sounds like 89 and we were like uh, yeah well you want to do like a socialist magazine and it's like a American and we're like, yeah, it sounds weird, but you know, so um, no one believed it would be possible and to have the money for that we had to really, we had to print the APC of capitalism, there was like a small brochure that we did by uh, Vivek Chibber and we printed it like in a really, like if you buy it, it's like really, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit cheap, but it's all we could do at the moment at the time and um, so then we sold like a thousand copies of this and that was great because that was actually a good finance to even start the whole thing so like doing uh, like, yeah, founding a publishing house is really yeah, uh, more stressful than you can think and then we had them with like a little bit of money and then we, tr we had to get like subscriptions before we even printed it uh, because we needed the money from the subscriptions to print the first issue. So it was really always like, oh, do we have enough money to do the rest? We never got like half a million uh, euros, you know, by anyone uh, to start it like you would usually probably do. But we always thought, okay, there is probably enough subscribers to do it. Mm -hmm. And then um, what we did, we started online beforehand and we have, it's like a pyramid, but like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, like this. So we have like online publication every day and it's uh, for free so you can read every online article for free. And so this is where we get like all the, uh, yeah, like, all the people reach us online basically and through social media. And then if you're like, oh maybe yeah, okay Jacobin, I like that article and then maybe they read three articles a week and then the, the, I don't know, then, like the, the, um, what we think will happen is then that people appreciate the online content so much that they also see, oh, they have a magazine and it's probably even better in print, it looks beautiful, that they, after that, they start subscribing to it. So we don't have like huge campaigns for subscriptions or we don't have like, like I said, I know we started uh, two years ago during Corona, so we didn't have like conference to give it out. So we only had this online content to go to people uh, and, and make them subscribe to us, which was, I think, yeah, the hard way, but then again, I don't, like if you start a new magazine, I wouldn't know how else to do it actually. To, to, you have to use the online market, um, I, mean, I think, to be able to also send the print product. But you have to have this print product because I don't think you can actually make enough money. You need to have some kind of product in the end um, to be able to then have this kind of material base. 
Um, not that a digital product could not also make money, but I mean, like this is yeah, this is the system that I think works for Jacobin in the U.S. and also in the other outlets and the other countries. And um, yeah, I think this is just a model that works for the moment when it comes to online and print publishing. Thank you. A hundred years ago, there was no online market yet. So, <laughs> Lande, tell me, how did you get so many subscribers? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Subscriptions is something very difficult to get subscriptions. And I will explain our, our, what, we, what we've done. Uh, I remember that when I entered in Argia to work uh, 15 years ago, uh, we, every year uh, we were losing subscribers, like going down, 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 down. And it was like a horrible sensation. It was like we are going to disappear, I don't know when, but it's not, no sense. And in those moments we decided to make a lot of changes uh, on our uh, journalistic work, on our focus, how, how we explain what is a subscription and stuff. And we began making like a little bit more, I don't, I don't know how to say it, like more social uh, journalism, like more accurate, more compromised with social movements, like uh, trying to, there was a, a big gap, like a lot of social, in, some, in the Basque country there are a lot of social movements who are not in the media. So we thought that we could be the media who were, among other things, we could give them voice and stuff. No? So um, um, six years ago we, made, we changed our subscription model. Uh, since then we had a fixed price, like it was 12 euros. Uh, per month, and you would receive uh, the, uh, the magazine weekly. And we decided to remove that and say, uh, if you subscribe to Argia, uh, you don't buy a magazine. Uh, you support the project. Um, and you can put the money that you want, and you can receive what you want. You can receive the magazine every week, every two weeks, every month, or not receive, or only <coughs> have the PDF, or like this, no? you are not buying something, you are supporting this project. Uh, this project that works for feminism, works for our language, for, for, uh, works for climate justice, stuff, no? And in that moment, it, we, had, we, we made a two year, uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, thinking process in, in the staff, because a lot of workers in the cooperative were very afraid to take out the price, and they were saying, mm -hmm. and if everybody puts one euro mm -hmm. and, uh, and is asking the magazine every week, it's not sustainable. And we were saying, no, that won't happen, because we will explain well what that we need that money, and that uh, if someone cannot put 12 euros and puts 5 euros, it's okay for us. And when we made that change, uh, the surprise came that uh, the average money right, go, went up because some people said, I can afford, I can pay 20 euros per month and other people uh, 10, other people 5, other 30 and like this. No? So now everybody pays what they want uh, and for example we make campaigns like, uh, for example in the corona, when the corona crisis uh, exploded, uh, we made a campaign saying that all this community supporting Argia, that we are very thanked uh, to them, that we make uh, independent journalism because uh, these people helps us. We knew that a lot of people were losing their jobs, that their bars were closed down and stuff, and that we were not, uh, if someone had problems to pay Argia, just they had to call or write, and that we were not charging since until they call back. And, and if someone wants to support this effort, and if someone wants to put more money, or wants to become a subscriber now, uh, that they could do it. And in that campaign, in one week, maybe 150 new people uh, made their subscription stuff. No? So it's somehow uh, we transmit the message is that in Argia, we are a community that uh, takes care of each other take care of each other. No, if someone cannot afford, 
to pay RBM, uh, the money will not never be the reason not to receive RBM. So if someone, people, someone asks uh, or calls RBM saying, I lost my job, I want to end up my subscription, we always say, but do you, do you read, uh, do you like it? And yes, okay, you, you have for free. And I think these kind of things um, that we make a good relationship with our community and people uh, are thanked of that and that helped us. For example, in the f last five years, we uh, went 25% up the number of s subscribers. Great, okay. I, my you. English is horrible and I am fighting for <laughs> 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 Look what the audience <laughs> 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 on to Bojan because now I want to know, uh, Vanikada um, is also financed a lot by uh, commercial activities. Tell me more about yeah, that. What do you sell? Well, we sell services related to uh, words and images. We can do anything with words and images, uh, which of course doesn't... Is this doesn't... a bit? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, you know, most of the things that we used to do um, before the pandemic has struck us real bad, by the way, uh, because, you know, and I want to refer to, uh, I'm not sure if you said that, but that we're not exactly beyond capitalism yet, right? <laughs> so, because we are not beyond capitalism, then all the fluctuations of the capitalist system, they actually have an effect on us and we have to take that into account. And that was the case for the last two years in Bulgaria and all over the world, pretty much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was a pretty difficult period because before 19, uh, sorry, before 2020, the, uh, the majority of the customers, mostly from abroad, by the way, you know, they ordered uh, printing materials because it was much cheaper to do that in Bulgaria. Yeah, they ordered uh, DTP layouts, you know, all kinds of graphic design, again, because it was cheaper done by us. Yeah, but at the same time, and I want to make that point, and uh, we, we have never made it uh, a kind of a precarious job to work for us. So regardless of the fact that uh, the prices you know, on the Bulgarian market or on the Eastern European market for services like that are cheaper, then you know, all our editors, all our specialists, all our reporters, all of them, with the exception of one pensioner and one student, who just didn't require that, are paid full proper wage on a full proper contract that is you know we cover their health insurance their pension and all the rest of it so and i think it's very important by the way because uh this is also the way to prove to the world to the outside world to the public opinion that it's not the case that the lefties have no idea of how to conduct business they know very well and they can do that better than the right wing people in the sense that we don't you know like, we don't cheat on things like, you know, we're not going to give you a contract or maybe after three months, for the first three months, you're going to receive an envelope under the table and all the rest of it, right? So, but that just, I'm digressing here. So, the, uh, the bulk of the, of the commercial activities were related to, to, to all kinds of, you know, design, video design, graphic design, and printing, of course, and then, of course, shipping it to wherever, uh, to wherever the customer was. Uh, then, you know, we also had some, uh, some orders which were kind of difficult for us to, uh, to manage because of their, uh, of their political profile. So that's, that's one of the kind of things that when you run a political, politically affiliated or politically motivated company, then you get an order, for example, to print a very uh, uncomfortable book or a book with you know a some kind of a comfortable content so there there were you know instances of us turning down you know orders because of course we didn't say that we did, we didn't like the customer we didn't like the order we just said that we don't have the capacity or something like this but yeah so so this is this is it right and uh, uh, and, and you know 
it can be really anything which uh, our specialists are able to process. Uh, you know, from speech recognition through graphic design to uh, you know video editing, including you know documentary movies and, and, and such motion pictures. So yeah, it's a very very wide range, and the agreement is that the minimum of 15% of the income, the minimum goes to uh, to the political fund. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, now, Uli, more than 90% uh, of the money that you have uh, for Radio Orange comes from the state. Mm -hmm. um, but even more money from the state goes to private media. So maybe tell us more about the politics of, of subsidies. How, how does this work? Complicated and with a lot of fights. Um, when I... Uh, uh, one month ago, when I should sit here, I would tell you a complete other story because um, one month ago we were very lucky in this town with uh, this uh, political situation. We have not a bad uh, contact with the Social Democratic Party, for example, but nowadays Octo, the, he's uh, the biggest uh, community uh, TV station in this uh, um, country. Now Octo has uh, really problems with the financial structure in this uh, city and uh, we are afraid about our friends. So yesterday I asked uh, about the gratis uh, boulevard media and the contacts with the Social Democratic uh, Party. Uh, so this is very hot. Um, uh, you know, um, the ÖVP is in a corruption uh, system, um, is trapped in her own cor uh, corruption system, but uh, that's maybe that's a uh, cultural practice in this country and not uh, addicted on the party. Um, the problem is that um, yesterday when you hear the discussion, uh, you are very um, uh, helpless when the um, wind is changing, when the uh, uh, powerful structures are going uh, right, right, right wing. And um, now we have the really scurril situation that we have another um, um, government with the Green and the Conservative Party and we have not a better situation than before where the left, uh, where the right, right wing and the Conservative uh, had a coalition. So this is not a very good situation, but uh, how comes this? Um, we are a very paternalistic country, um, so I make this joke with the Count Car. This is not a joke uh, without a sense, uh, it's, it's not senseless. Uh, people want to have very cheap food, but they want to pay a lot for high culture. They want to have nothing to pay for uh, information, but they want to have uh, a fight for uh, uh, a very important uh, 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 brands for uh, um, expensive clothes. So uh, we are in a very uh, strange situation. And um, nowadays, the uh, party of the Neos, they come to us, come to me and say, why do you want to be so addicted on this money? Make more crowdfunding, make a private, more private uh, income. And uh, I made this joke and I make it again. And I said, we are not Kim Kardashian. When we uh, want to have money with a campaign, so we will earn so much money that the, the person who has this job uh, can uh, survive with this money. So that's uh, really stupid um, to talk about this. So um, we can't change, Radio Orange can't change the habitus in this paternalistic uh, country. But we are one of, we, we don't give up, of course, and uh, we have a lot of uh, projects who, uh, where people can uh, be involved and uh, 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 we want to make a lot of different um, uh, small projects, uh, but the, the, the wages we can't found with projects. So, you know, um, the uh, expensive things are wages not the uh, production. 
Okay, thank you. The next topic now after organization and money, the next topic I want to talk about is repression. Um, because left media is always under attack of capitalism, um, whether financially, as we've heard before, or politically, or um, by law. Um, uh, I think we heard before, or I talked to Uli before, and she told me that in former days the police and uh, the federal office for the protection of the constitution, the Verfassungsschutz, used to show up at the radio station. This is no longer the case. And I also asked uh, the others if they have um, made experiences with repression. Um, Ines said for Jacobin they didn't have any experiences yet, right? Only cyber attacks. Cyber attacks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cyber attacks and uh, Buyan told me the police is not coming, the tax police is coming. Um, but uh, I wanted to um, ask Landa because you told me about the black day for Basque journalism when you decided that day uh, that you will become a journalist and I wanted to ask uh, more about that, what happened on this day in February 2004. Yes. Uh... Uh, we, we have to say the background is that in, in the Basque country the Spanish police has closed down newspapers, magazines and radios with a bit impunity. That has happened and, and it's something normal for us. And people get angry, but that shit happens, no? And uh, this newspaper did the excuse has always been that these newspapers, these magazines, these radios were part of ETA, ETA, the um, group. And that, that is why they were, they were closing them. And I remember when I said before that in the 80s, uh, the workers of Argia bought the project because they thought that our language needed a, new, uh, a weekly magazine. A mag the only magazine in Basque was that one and that we couldn't, we couldn't lose it. And that team was an exceptional team because they were not, they were not professional workers in the magazine. It was a militant work. They used to work in other places, but in their free time, they were making a weekly magazine for 10 years. And apart from that, these brilliant people thought, we need also a newspaper in, in Basque language. And uh, a lot of people were saying, no, but uh, newspaper is not possible, uh, we don't have enough readers, we don't have money, we don't have publishers, and they were like very stubborn, and they said, no, no, we, we have to make a newspaper. And they did it. During, the, during years they made the weekly magazine, they created the newspaper, and like they made a huge crowdfunding, and I think they collected like maybe 3 million euros like making campaigns down by down by down, like we need money, we need money, we need money, and, and a lot of people put money and the newspaper was created. And that newspaper was like a huge symbol for past people. I remember myself that my father used to buy it every day. And, and the, to have a newspaper in your language is something very important. Maybe those who, you that speak uh, big languages, you are not, uh, aware of that, of that, but if you speak a little language, to have your own newspaper in your language is something very, very strong. And that was in the 1990 that it was created. But in 2003, uh, one day we, we woke up uh, listening in the radio that the Spanish police had, uh, went, had gone to the headquarters and that they had uh, closed it down and that they had arrested all the direction on board where one of our colleagues was also arrested who was the first director of the newspaper and all, all the direction board were very important Basque cult cultural people like they were journalists and uh, writers and stuff they were the direction of the newspaper and they were arrested and they were tortured during five years or five days, sorry uh, and it was like a huge shock for us. Like, like they can do what they want with us. They have closed down the newspaper, saying that it was part of ETA. When they even criticized ETA many times, and like, like it, we knew that it was false. But the minister, the Spanish minister, was talking to the Spanish people. They didn't know the newspaper, and a lot of people clapped it, saying, "Ah, oh, it's okay." 
So uh, those days, uh, it, uh, the, imagine 150 workers of the newspaper. Suddenly, uh, their, their newspaper was closed down. You don't have job. Uh, they create. They made a newspaper for the next day in in another place, and they continued making the newspaper. Thing, and that, that way, and in three days. Uh, a huge march was uh, uh, organized in San Sebastian, the, the, the biggest demonstration I have ever seen in my city. Like, hundreds of thousands of people went out saying that, please stop, now you can do what you, you are doing too much against us. And that day is, uh, we say, uh, the 20th uh, February is the Black Day of Bachelor's Journalism. And that, that day I was 17 years old and I had to decide what to, what to study, architecture, informatics or, or journalism. And I decided to become a journalist because of that. And yes, and we have to say that later these people made again a huge crowdfunding and they again collected 5 million euros in the society and they created again a new newspaper and now we have a Basque newspaper and we are the weekly magazine, but yes, that's a very uh, harmful story for us, and that, that's life. <laughs> and, and I want to say that, that no, that's not the only rotation story. I mean, for example, we uh, in Algia, we have the sad honor to be the, the first media in the Spanish state to be punished uh, with the gag law because we published uh, a piece of news where we took pictures of the police, uh, police operation, and they, made, they put a fine against us, and we said that we were disobeying, and that we were not paying, and we went to court, and we, we beat them. We beat the Spanish state, and we, we didn't pay. Or, or covering like uh, demonstrations and stuff, we have had several uh, sad stories, like uh, attacks from the police, or, we have videos on YouTube, like people, <laughs> our journalists of our magazine, Peter and yes. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I was uh, wondering in your, when, when you said that there were hundreds of thousands of people on the street uh, protesting, um, so you have um, a lot of people, like a lot of people really support your work. Uh, you have this big, you already said it before, you have this uh, big community who sees it as part of their militant uh, work to also support you financially. And uh, you also said that your goal is to inform the biggest audience, as big as possible. Um, I was wondering for, for all of you, because, not for, for Radio Orange, we'll come back to that later, but for the others, um, how do you reach so many people. What is your vision? How do you uh, how do you want to reach more and more people? Because we know that the, one of the biggest challenges for all left organizations seems to be attracting people. So, um, yes, yeah, tell me more about your strategies, and also maybe if the bad and evil corporate platforms play a role. You start. Okay. You go back. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I just said, we and as you said, we're not living beyond capitalism. We have to use the platforms, the capitalist platforms that exist, no matter if uh, Elon Musk owns them or not. I mean, we have to use it because, as I said, our whole model depends on basically reaching out to people um, online. Um, so, yeah, we have to use them. I mean, we you can use them consciously, but you still have to use them. I don't believe in, like using only alternatives, we are really pragmatic in that sense, saying that you cannot really leave capitalism or go beyond it, um, just like that. Even with your socialist um, like content, I think you have to sort of try to um, convince more and more people. Um, and we try to do that by, as I said, like on online accessibility, but also from uh, the text we produce and also the product we have, if you have taken a look at it, it at least tries to be um, like uh, accessible and, and beautiful in the sense that you don't feel like, oh, this is like socialist or left-wing theory, I'm fuck, uh, it's just totally in your face, but it's like a nice way to say, like, um, or to tell story of people, like what I try to 
do a lot now is having more bottom-up stories of organizing and of like um, workers because it tells the whole story and just like Sabina said, said yesterday that implicitly all the other um, media are taking like the ruling classes stance or like the stance of like the hegemon whatever at the state and we're trying to do um, the opposite and this is unusual but you have to you know in order to attract people for what you think is politically um, right, I think you need to also think about how do I tell the same stories or how do I use um, like journalistic formats that people are used to, but have a different kind of uh, political content and also like a completely different standpoint. And so, yeah, but we're still trying to uh, yeah, have a nice design and to be as accessible text-wise and design-wise as possible in order to open up and to make it uh, yeah, more accessible than usually because you would always think like, oh, oh no, I haven't read Marx, I cannot understand this. And we want it to be completely different, that you're like attracted to um, what we do and then feel like, yeah, maybe we could have a different kind of society, maybe we could live differently, um, but it's not like uh, theory thrown in your face, at least. Yeah, this is what we try to do. Um, you can judge, you, you're the judge of judges if this actually works out. But. You said that you, when you're writing, you have this 15-year-old uh, yeah. boy in mind. Maybe tell yeah. more about that. Yeah, exactly. Like we have, I think when you have, you know, the Zeit probably, it's like this, uh, I don't know, liberal um, German uh, weekly. And I think what they have in mind is that the teacher reads them <laughs> every week. It's like the Studienrat, who's like 50 years old from South Germany, is like their perfect reader. And if I imagine my perfect reader, it would be more like a 15 year old student uh, from school who should understand basically every text, even though it's on economics or like political theory. Um, culture, whatever. So I, I'm. I know that this is not always working. Like not every text is probably also not in the, this issue, especially this one. This is the double issue. It's really like a huge book. So I know this is um, really on the line. But um, like usually we have this really young person in mind who has not yet read everything, and she's not like the perfect socialist. Who, like no one is. Um, so I think everyone should be able to read it. And yeah, this is the ideal reader that we have in mind. Thank you. Uh, what I thought was really interesting when Bojan told me about uh, the how to reach the audience was Telegram. Tell us more about oh, yeah. Telegram. Well, so one way to reach the audience to expand uh, our reach is, of course, to use the uh, well the available technologies to the extent that they are available to us. Because, for example, platforms, the most trendy platforms, still most trendy, like Facebook or Twitter, they're less and less available to us because of the algorithms and because of well, all the mechanisms that downgrade our position <coughs> on those platforms, and it's getting increasingly, it's been getting increasingly frustrating and irritating and annoying for the last, say, two years and a half, even more than that, probably. Uh, although we have, we've had some initial very great successes, I would say there, <coughs> particularly with our Bulgarian outlet, uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I have to give credit where credit's due, which is Facebook has helped quite a lot in the in the first phase. But then, uh, yeah, well, Telegram is a thing mostly for Eastern Europeans, I think, uh, because it's Russian. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's like, it's not very popular in the West, but uh, it's, um, it is pretty popular throughout Eastern Europe, and, you know, we mostly focus, even our English language outlet is basically focused on Eastern European affairs. Also some, you know, articles and analysis and, and reports from other parts of the world. But this is, uh, this is our main area of journalistic expertise, if you like. So yeah, we use that. And, uh, you know, Telegram has this kind of capacity, well, capacity, but yeah, um, well, it has this kind of feature that it doesn't have any algorithms. So uh, whatever you put out on your public Telegram channel, it's there for every subscriber to scroll up and down and to basically see everything. And they can forward it, they can like it, they can share it on other platforms, and so on and so, so forth. So yeah, that's, that's one way. But I have to say that our uh, main, uh, like the main mechanism which made us, the main element uh, in our strategy which made us popular, I think, as a left-wing outlet and, uh, and made us um, widely accepted in the Bulgarian, uh, within the Bulgarian public opinion, is the fact that we have acquired uh, a different to other previously, uh, previous attempts to establish media outlets. First of all, we wanted to make it a professional one, which means we as I told you previously, employ journalists, you know, we pay them <clears throat> uh, fairly 
and, and, and according to law and so on and so forth. But second thing is we also, you know, we don't, we don't enforce, you know, the ideology that we, we have uh, on the people. We rather try to start from where people are and from there, you know, extrapolate to, you know, ideological levels so that people can get accustomed to, you know, all of the nuances that we want to, we would like them to familiarize themselves with through our, <coughs> through our articles and, uh, and through our productions. And another element here is that, you know, it's very important, really, because, again, I don't know what things are like uh, exactly in Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe, because of the certain, you know, confusion that are, uh, occurred after 1989 and because of the plight of the, uh, of the previous system, you know, the new generation of the left uh, kind <coughs> of developed a certain sort of political culture which I think was very turning off for many people, I mean the white public, because the lefties in Eastern Europe, they started at one moment to perceive themselves as special. Like, you know, they know better than everyone. They can analyze things better. They can tunnel through all the indicators that are floated in the you know, mainstream media and they can understand things. And they were just getting increasingly frustrated that no one appreciates their, you know, great uh, <laughs> capacity. So we felt, we felt like this is a pathological element of the political culture. We want to cut ourselves off this and we never, never, we really invest a lot of effort in that, never look down on the public. Regardless of what they concretely and specifically think on certain issues, we, we try to look for elements which are, to the extent that it's possible, <coughs> uniting. And because, uh, because, you know, as socialists, as leftists, we, we we believe that the community is at the core of everything. In the final aftermath. And last but not least, uh, except for Telegram and all those me social media platforms and our uh, the way we adjusted to you know to the changing conditions, we also adjusted uh, to we also adjusted to a certain extent the format because we started out as an outlet where people write only and exclusively. So we produce text in different languages. Uh, and and uh, and that was great, but except for that, at one point we just noticed that uh, people are demanding other things: podcasts, video podcasts, uh, you know, video reports, and uh, and so on and so forth. So we launched subsequently, you know, YouTube channels uh, and and you know, SoundCloud and and all, all all the other platforms where you can find podcasts in audio or video format. So those are, I would say, the three main things uh, that I'll, that we use, uh, three main directions that we <clears throat> that we focus on in order to expand uh, the audience of our outlets. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have, if we take a look at Radio Orange, it's quite different because the listeners are not the focus. I would say, and uh, you you said. <laughs> 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 you said so before, I hope you said it, not me, but you said, I think you said the biggest freedom of terrestrial radio is that you don't know how many listeners you have. Um, and your work is focused, as far as I understood, on enabling people to make media themselves. Yes, uh, educate people in becoming media makers. So tell us more about that. The first. Uh, so a part of the question or the second? Uh, the first one is, of course, we are very interested to know uh, who are our audience is, but it's very expensive to know this. Um, you are, most of you are um, um, in the science and you know that uh, to uh, look at the audiences in classical radio, so you have to make telephone uh, um, methods and this is really very expensive. You do this when you are addicted on the advertisements. So the uh, price of the advertisement depends on the quotes uh, of the audiences. So we don't do this. 
we have no money for that. We have money for our um, small employees, for the frequents, for the IT structure, for the uh, uh, non-commercial and open source IT development. This is one thing I have a very uh, broken heart about this. Everybody is talking about digitalization and politics of digitalization, and uh, we want to have a democratic policy uh, development of digitalization. And so we need a special founders for non-profit open source development. This is not um, a, a reality in the EU. So you know about 50% of everything you have to pay for your own. That's the logical of the private market. And uh, um, public good of uh, um, development of open source is not in their mind. And we know the um, literature of Mazzucato that uh, everything who is uh, is a development uh, developed in in the public uh, uh, is uh, done in the privatization of uh, the, the uh, products. So that this one um, um, about the audiences. We think uh, we have a technical uh, reachment about three million people, but we don't know how is hearing us, uh, how who is hearing us, and is sitting uh, in the kitchen and cooking, or is um, in the uh, car and is hearing us. When we look at our stream, then it's very. Um, <coughs> Sad. Then we see how many people are hearing us in the internet. And then when I have my own show, I see oh there are 15 people. No, now 12. So it's not a really uh, big motivation for to know uh, everything. Um, but we have our archive. That means uh, the fluid. Um, um, terrestrial canal is freedom because you can't control the people, that's good. I think that's also good in the 21st century again. Uh, and I forgot. Yeah, the archive. Yes, when uh, we have an archive, it's also non-commercial. Non, uh, uh, that's the um, CBA, the Cultural Broadcasting Archive, and you see that's the biggest archive uh, in this area. I think about 30,000 podcasts are there, and you can have it for a long time and hear it afterwards. For example, a lot of the wonderful shows of our Global Dialog, this is the biggest uh, reduction, about 30 women and queer uh, who have a really very good program and they have it also in the archive and you hear it and you can hear it 10 years later. Um, this was the first part. I'm very long with my horrible second, English. In the second part I would like to know more about the media education that you do for... Yeah, um, we have a free um, radio, so people have to learn about media law, learn about the technical stuff, and we have <coughs> gratis workshops for the radio makers who are uh, producing a show, for example, how to write for the audio, um, um, texting for um, different people in different languages, um, what is classism, uh, how to speak in an intersectional um, way, um, how to hear um, the uh, anti-racist uh, anti um, uh, position and so on. And um, we have a gremium, what's this? Council? Yeah, and they are elected, uh, uh, four people um, are elected uh, in this gremium um, from the free radio makers. Uh, 
every uh, um, um, all two years uh, there is an election. 500 radio makers um, 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 voting for the yeah. council. I'm schon ganz depper da. Und das über Mehrsprachigkeit zu reden. I, I, I was uh, looking two weeks to find a person who wants to sit here and talk in English. And everybody said, Uli, go, go for it. Give the boss. And I am the right. I'm the right one. Yeah? So I'm sorry. But uh, we have a lot of uh, trainings and we have the material also on our website, so it's a free content also to read this uh, uh, educational stuff and so on. So we want to have a transparent organization and also a transparent uh, education structure behind this. Thank you. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. I have one more question for all of you and then it's open for the audience. All of you, you work across state borders and the war in Ukraine made it clear once again we need more exchange to understand local perspectives. What are, and that's the question for all of you, it's the same question, what are your experiences with international cooperation? We start with, oh, Landa, you have the mic. Okay. You start, yeah. Um, we, we have agreements with some other uh, independent media in, in the Spanish state, in Catalonia, in Galicia, and in Madrid, stuff. And we have like private telegram groups where there are two journalists from each media. And if someone has a very good story that is interesting for the others to translate, we share there. Mm -hmm. And we, I think, and in Argia we fight for it, uh, think that a very important element for this cross boarding information is the license, the Creative Commons license. Uh, that helps us uh, to give the information as much as possible. I mean, uh, nobody never has paid uh, for an article to be translated uh, from Arbia. If someone asks in Germany or in Australia, can I translate your article? Of course, no? And like uh, right-wing media, or I don't know how to say, like conservative media, they have their own press agencies where they uh, put news and all the media have in the same moment like boom, the same news all over the world uh, I think independent media uh, if we work with Creative Commons licenses uh, we can share our information for free it's decentralized and I think that could be an element to for the information to be to transform. Thank you, Boya. Well, I've got some very great experience uh, in terms of international collaboration, but I've also got some sad <laughs> experience. Uh, you know, the the great thing is that thanks to the internet and uh, thanks to the communication uh, platforms and, and communication options, we were able to contact people from you know halfway around the world, and we were able to exchange materials and so on and so forth. And it worked great. And you know, we do common projects. Uh, you know. We, uh, we help each other in all kinds of ways, you know, we exchange materials, you know, we interview each other, we sort of help promoting things uh, through all kinds of, you know, profiles and social media or uh, wherever. Uh, I, I think the sad part, and that's something which, um, which has been, you know, frustrating me for the last decade and a half, I think, uh, is that, you know, there are countless projects, leftist projects all over the world. You know, countless, you know, small, big, medium-sized outlets making, you know, their way difficultly. And it, you know, that, that's, they have to endure a lot of hardships mostly. Uh, you know, all over the world, and you know, there were so many attempts, and I participated in some to sort of try and, and you know, unite it to, to the extent that it's possible. I mean, united in a sense to, to, to unite the, uh, the efforts so, you know, that people don't that, 
you know, don't, don't do the same thing, just uh, like in five or ten different spots in the world. And unfortunately, most of those uh, projects so far have uh, not really been effective to the extent that I like to see it because, uh, well, because of many factors. But, uh, you know, my experience is that there are many generals who like to, you know, run their own show, but there are very little soldiers who would like to fight in those armies. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be moderately optimistic about it. And I'm, I'm hoping very much that it, uh, it is possible and that we can overcome, you know, certain uh, elements in our political culture that are restraining us from achieving this international uh, effective co collaboration. Uh, I think there are many, uh, uh, well, there are many attempts which seem promising at the moment. Uh, but also what is important is, like you mentioned, the war, and I think the war is, a, of course, it's a horrible thing and it should stop as, as quickly as possible, but the fact, fact of the matter is that it did, uh, it, it did produce a lot of interest in the region of Eastern Europe among Western, uh, Western journalists. I'm talking alternative journalists like, you know, leftist uh, journalists or just some kind of civic. Uh, journalists, reporters, activists, and so on and so forth. So we are getting a lot of requests. You know, we're getting a lot of inquiries. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, we get a lot of hits on our website or on our, you know, social media platforms uh, where people are looking for, for example, our analysis from way before the war, right? But about the situation there. And those articles and those programs, uh, podcasts are getting a lot of traction so in this sense, uh, well, let me just repeat it, I'm trying to be moderately optimistic. Thank you. Yeah, I was always thinking about the left Google News, that would be great, you could just type it. Well, we've been turned down by Google News so many times, like we were trying <laughs> to become their Okay, a leftist version. Um, but Ines, tell me more about your cooperation, because that was the base of the yeah, model. Yeah, so, uh, it, Jacobin is originally from the US, they founded it uh, 11 years ago now, and so obviously because the English speaking world is so big, Jacobin became uh, huge and by now it's like a, uh, like a franchise. And when people ask me like, what is that, what is the kind of model, and I'm always saying like I used to work for Subway Sandwiches, and it's basically the same, it's like you're selling a socialist magazine to different countries and you can like, basically have the, you, we have the right to translate every text. Um, from the Americans, by the Americans, and like also the Jacobin Italia, Jacobin Brazil, and Jacobin Latin America, like we translate from English to Spanish and Portuguese and into German and Italian. So we have by now a really wide range of like um, yeah countries and also languages that we can theoretically <laughs> um, translate. And I think one quarter of our texts um, are translations, mostly um, from English to, into German. But also, like I think, um, as you said, like many um, left-wing journalists are now writing for American Jacobin, and then we translate from English into German. So I think, uh, yeah, this kind of um, thinking of international solidarity comes back to what we can do as like media people or press people is really like translating, but not only translating in the sense that you just, I don't know, translate words, uh, but more empathetically, really, uh, to translate also try to translate like a different cultural context and like, I don't know, uh, contradictions within that context and you give it like a little bit more information, like you really need good people to have a really good translation, you cannot just run it through deep L and then, you know, <laughs> hope that this will be fine, but you really need to give some kind of context and I think this also translates into more political understanding, I mean, ideally, it's, I'm not going not gonna to say that this happens always, some texts just don't work then in the German context, but we also like we try to think of what would German-speaking people um, understand, and yeah, even though maybe some texts don't run well, I think it's a we are convinced that we also need to just uh, do that, like also run texts on I don't know elections on the Philippines or in Czech Republic, because we just think that readers should know about this. Is there um, like left-wing candidate or is there none? because it's really important to also know, you know, where is like a strike going on in India or not. Um, this is not in, like usual German media, so uh, this is yeah, part of our task, and as I said, it's like one quarter of what we do is just international topics. Okay.
Okay, thank you. We have some time left now for questions. Um, can you give the microphone yeah. to Kellen and uh, yeah, just ask what you want to know? I will wait if somebody besides me is wants to ask something. No. Ah, okay, and then you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the discussion. Uh, I've got a question for Landa. Um, you said you work in a cooperative way, so that means that you know, like you're all equal, you have the same wage and all those things. Yesterday we heard that uh, you know you never you never get rid of a problem when you change the system. You just change the problems that come along with the system. So my question is, do you, even though you don't have any, you know, like an owner that has the power and can tell you what you have to write? Do you experience any sort of uh, other influence by maybe your coworkers or someone else? So is there also still some kind of structure of power? And you know, like what are the problems that maybe come with this cooperative system that you just described? Okay. No, you can ask now. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the magazine is ours, and we feel and we are very empowered. Uh, especially in the history, we have had big uh, tensions with the Basque pro-independence left movement, like because sometimes they try to tell you what you have to write, no? And we have been quite clear, and we've had big hits, like no, we are the magazine is ours, and we write what we want, no? And during the years we have had quite uh, big tensions, but nowadays uh, everybody respects. Argia has uh, uh, gained the position, like even from the institutions, like they are governed by the Basque Nationalist Party, like right-wing uh, conservative party, and they also think they are sometimes angry with the articles we write against them or uh, against things they do, and. They can make a phone call, and the answer is, I'm sorry, man, what do you, do you think you have the power to tell me what we, what we have to write? No. No, we will write what we think, and we don't write against you. We write for our community, and if we write something, it's because we think it's important for the people to know. And that in the last years, uh, we have worked in the, in the team, in the workers, like, not to let uh, be afraid. I don't know how to say. It. Like not to not to accept this kind of uh, relationships. And with the um, advertisements and stuff, uh, there were sometimes like public uh, institutions saying, "Okay, I will put you one page uh, advertisement, but if you uh, write an article saying that the high speed train is good." and say, no, go off with your page, because if you want, you can rent this page, and you can put what you want, even uh, the, what you want, but you are not going to say what we have to write, and we don't accept this kind of uh, tensions. And but I think the question was more focused on within the cooperative, within Inside. the workers, do you have like a power imbalance or like an informal Informal no. power structure, the oldest one or the one who is longest in the business, we <coughs> tell the other people what to do, or would you say, no, we, no it's quite balanced? We, we, and maybe we also take a we, look at your colleagues yeah, there. We take care of the atmosphere in the workers, mm -hmm. like, I mean, if we have to take care of each other, and, and we don't, uh, since we have working groups, like, I mean, working, uh, writing for politics, I, I am not the only one writing, we are for people. And before writing, we talk to each other, like, what do you think if we write an article about this or that? And we, we try to help to each other, and then we do what we can, as best as possible. And maybe sometimes we had, like, tensions, like, when the corona crisis uh, broke up, and we were, like, a lot of people, and some people think different from each other. And, like, there were tensions about some articles, and we were, like, making, like, okay, we, we have to take one morning, off and we have to talk about what we think each other and then we have to reach some agreements like 
the point, this point we all agree, no? Okay, so then let's write about this. And this kind, we, we it's, it's true that it's horizontal and it, it works for us. Okay, the next question. Yeah, thank you as well from my side uh, to all the panelists for this uh, discussion. I might have a somewhat utopian question because uh, most of all, uh, most of you, if not all, mentioned that you're not beyond capitalism. So I wondered what will your media outlets look like once you are beyond capitalism? So will they look the same or will they look differently? Like maybe imply, will they be better? Who wants to start? I want to say an anecdote. Um, like when we changed the subscription system, like uh, six years ago, and we said there is not a fixed price uh, for to support the project, we were talking like going beyond capitalism and accepting uh, instead of money, work. I mean, if you <laughs> fix uh, computers, maybe you can say. Uh, I don't pay money, but I am ready to work 20 hours of informatics for someone in the community of Argia. And that, I do that and I receive the, the magazine. And someone else maybe says, okay, I have oranges. Uh, I, I can give you 10 kilos of oranges every week. And we've been thinking about it, we, we haven't done it, but maybe one day we will do it. <laughs> <laughs> Society, no. <laughs> but, um, who else wants to say something? Um, in these wild days, no advertisement, so uh, we are visible. Um, <coughs> the problem of the community media is we have no money for advertisements, that's good. But on the other side, nobody knows us. Uh, everybody is used to uh, inform about uh, another second structure. In this ideal world, people are interested in the content and uh, they want to hear different things. And some Viennese guys sometimes spend private money to this uh, uh, radio. Um, although the state uh, is a good founder for uh, um, diversity in media. So this is my really sweet and very naive uh, utopia. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta say, I really like the concept of 10 kilograms or, of oranges per week. We would have to have something accepted that. And I think uh, uh, once I'm back, I'm going to discuss with the rest of the editorial crew that we should launch a campaign to do that kind of stuff. Particularly, we should speak to uh, wine producers. <laughs> so we'll let you know how it's going. And, uh, uh, but, but, you know, to the question uh, regarding how our company is going to look like once we deal, uh, once capitalism is over in Bulgaria, well, I'm not sure, but I don't want to see our company nationalized. I, not because I necessarily have anything against nationalizations, but, you know, I really think that our companies run better when it's private. So uh, it's uh, I, in this in this respect, I don't think much is going to change. I'm rather hoping for the environment that we're working to change, and thus, of course, for our media to become more popular and maybe, hopefully, merged with some other projects that are going to be developing uh, once you know we happily overthrow uh, the capitalist regime. <laughs> really hard to even think about like this kind of utopia. So I try to think internally that I think because we have a really strict division of labor because it's like just the thing that you need to have and we have really strong democratic centralism which I think we would keep probably even after capitalism. Um, 
but that's a different question. Uh, but I think we, I would like for everyone in the editorial board and on the design team, for everyone to be able to have the time to learn like everything, like everyone could be able to do the job of the other person. That would be ideal in a sense that I think we could also democratize the more the work that we have because we don't have to work under like time pressure and also financial pressure. That would be nice for our collective and uh, yeah, to make everyone like being able to also lead the editorial board and stuff like that. That would be uh, that would be ideal. But this is only thought internally because externally I really have problems even imagining it. So um, yeah, sorry, this is really uh, downgraded. <laughs> this is downgraded your question a lot. Sorry. No, it's fine. I think. Uh... Maybe some of the answers already sparked uh, some inspiration um, for later discussions, and maybe wine will help also. Um, <laughs> but now we have to come to an end. Uh, I'm very sure that tonight you can discuss a lot of the points also between you that uh, all of the points that were raised during this panel. Um, I thank all of you a lot. It was a pleasure talking to you. It was very interesting and also funny and inspiring um, and I also want to thank Laura and Callum again for putting this panel together. I want to thank the technical crew um, and also of course all of the members of the organization committee and all of the helping hands and I have to say now that after this <laughs> session there are still workshops so don't leave, <laughs> uh, stay here, go to the workshops because you know it's all do it yourself you can't leave it to the others and uh, tonight uh, we also have this um, dinner at a place called divan and uh, we are really happy to see you there did i miss anything no but uh, we also want to thank you like the whole panel but also the moderator thank you very much Senda. <laughs> Than markets are, so that's why we have wine here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Get one bottle, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, thank you very much, and see you in the workshops and later at Divine. <laughs>